I assume by now everybody knows a lot about the double slit experiment, so I'm going to go through this very quickly. If you take uh, elementary particles, quanta, photons, electrons, and so on, you send them through two slits, and you look at a screen to, to see what happens. If you don't know which of the two slits the particle went through, then you get an interference pattern. And this, of course, works just as well if you're sending a single photon or single electron at one time. The mystery is that as soon as you do know, by any means, which of the two slits the particle goes through, then you get a, a pattern that looks like it's particles. This is, of course, leads to the famous wave particle duality. And in a much more pr practical sense, it leads to this sort of thing. The caption says, it says the cost of the flight went up because we acknowledged its existence. <laughs> so there's something peculiar about observation. And this is, of course, the quantum measurement problem, which you can, has been described before here, but I'm going to do it in a simpler form. You have some sort of a system which could be a double slit, any kind of physical system, some sort of measuring apparatus. And the measuring apparatus does an observation of the system. From a, a quantum perspective, you take the tensor product between the two quantum systems, the two physical systems, and you end up with a system and the measurement apparatus no longer being independent. So we can say that the two physical systems are entangled. So from a quantum perspective, we're just dealing with complex waves. There's, there's no particle-like behavior yet. John Bell made this sketch to illustrate the problem. Well, where does the measurement end? So if you imagine that you, you have a photon, and it goes through two slits, and it hits a screen, you might have a photo detector, and then you might have a human uh, a counter that looks at the number of times that the photo detector goes off, and then the human eye and the human brain. All of those are physical systems. All of them are therefore quantum. Well, why do we see a particle? Why does observation make a difference? So this is sometimes called the, uh, the von Neumann chain or the Heisenberg chain. Where is the cut made? When does quantum become classical? John von Neumann said that the measurement chain ends only when knowledge of the measurement is registered by what he called an extra physical factor. In other words, you, you can't use another physical system to end the chain because it just becomes more quantum. So you need something extra physical by which he meant consciousness. And he wasn't alone in his opinion. Almost all of the founders of quantum mechanics said something like this in various ways, but go all the way back to Bohr and, and even Planck. They all said something like this, and this continues to the present day, as you know. This is uh, today a minority opinion within physics, but nevertheless, it has a pretty prominent uh, background. So I've been aware of this, of course, and everyone offers theories about consciousness, but nobody does anything about it when it comes to this particular problem, the measurement problem. So what we did in, in the laboratory is we, we built a double slit system, and fortunately it's a very simple type of a system. You have a laser, you have a filter, you have a double slit, and you have a camera that looks at the result. So the only new element in this experiment is that we ask people, in this case like a meditator, to keep the double slit in mind and to imagine in their mind's eye that they could see which of the two slits that the photon went through. Uh, this is, as, we could, as far as we could tell, the only way of directly testing whether consciousness is actually collapsing the wave function. So this is what the apparatus looks like. The tube sticking out of the long box there is the, the far end of the helium neon laser, and the, the, the uh, double slit and the camera are inside the box, so it's a sealed system. You can't see it with your eye, you can only use your mind's eye. This is the camera, it's called a line camera, and this particular one is 3,000 pixels long in a line. And what the camera sees is an alternating band of light and dark. This is the interference pattern. Uh, when you look at this in the software, you can say, well, how bright is each band? And you get a picture that looks something like that. Does that show up? Yeah. So you get this sort of Gaussian looking shape. And that's the way of looking at the interference. So if we start with that pattern in, in uh, picture A, you can do a Fourier transform, which is picture B, and the peak in the middle is now the double slit spectral power. And this is the way we initially started doing these experiments, with looking at the power spectrum. 
And this is convenient because, again, we ask someone who, in this case, in the laboratory is two meters away from the sealed optical system. We ask them to keep the double slit in mind. And then the measurement is very simple. We predict that if observation is doing something to the interference pattern, that the double slit component of that interference will go away, or at least it'll go down. In addition, because this is an abstract task, the, the double slit itself is about, uh, each slit is 10 microns across. And if you just simply hold up the double slit to somebody to, to have them look at it, they may or may not even be able to see it. So it's difficult for some people to imagine that they can, in their mind's eye, see what's going on in that space. So we do a real-time analysis of the, of the double slit power, and we use that to adjust uh, feedback tone. So if you have somebody doing the task, they could look at a screen, which is showing a signal, or they can simply do it by listening to the tone. And generally what we do is we have like a, a droning tone, and we ask the person to make the droning tone louder, make it just louder because it's a very pleasant tone, and then uh, that if they would know that they were succeeding through that tone. This also provides a way to, to focus their mind on the task at hand, because mind wandering is always a big problem. The protocol is very simple as well. We compare the double slit power during mental observation versus no observation. They get a, a voice message which says, now concentrate, and then now relax, and this alternates. We do the ob observation periods for 30 seconds, and the rest periods are 30 seconds, plus or minus a random five seconds, for reasons I'll mention later. This is repeated in a typical session 40 times. So the whole session lasts 20 minutes. And the measure that we're interested in is a differential measure. We're asking what is the double slit power while observing versus while resting. So that it, and there are many ways of doing the statistics. We generally present it in terms of a z-score a or an effect size. So we did our first experiment in this form. Uh, this was for 35 sessions, 20 minutes apiece, 15 people contributed it. Overall, you can see the, the mean and one standard error. We did actually pretty good. Meditators did a little bit better than the non-meditators. And uh, the prediction was that the double slip power would drop during observation, and indeed, that's what we saw. So when we do experiments of this type, especially when they work the first time, we're always suspicious about the first timer's effect, or everybody's very enthusiastic about what's going on. Uh, so we, we repeat it again and again. So we did four pilot studies, each time adjusting things in various ways and uh, looking at different kinds of aspects of, uh, of the design. And in each case, each one of the four pilot studies, the meditators did quite well. Uh, if you just combine everybody, the green dots are the overall result, and in some of the experiments, the non-meditators did not do very well. Uh, they tend to mind wander pretty quickly. So there's a, as you remember, there's a 30 second period where you're asked to do this abstract task of putting your mind in a box at a distance. And they can do that for about four seconds and then they can't do it anymore. So the overall result of the pilot studies was this. Uh, you see, again, overall, we got a pretty nice effect. Uh, meditators did quite well. Non-meditators overall got actually close to chance. And we ran the same system. And this, by the way, was 250 20-minute sessions, 137 people. And we ran the same system again and again uh, as controls, which are the white dots. And we don't see any, any uh, artifacts within the hardware or software or analytics uh, that would suggest that there's some kind of bias in the system. So here it looks like observation was collapsing the wave function. At least the meditators could do that. And the control tests, we don't see any effect. So we were encouraged by this to go ahead and do a formal experiment, formal in the sense that we pre-specified how many sessions we would do in advance, so 50 sessions. So here's the result of the 50-session pre-planned experiment using the same analysis that we had used in the previous experiments. and this gave us a five sigma result. So for those of you who are not used to the term sigma, it's, think of it in terms of z-score. It's the same thing, standard normal deviate. So we got a five sigma result uh, when people were observing and when nobody was doing the observing, we got almost exactly chance. Uh, when we do an experiment like that and we get a very strong result, if you keep in mind that a five sigma result was able to give uh, CERN the Nobel Prize for finding the Higgs, Higgs particle, which turned out not to be Higgs after all, uh, well, we got a five sigma result too, but I haven't heard from the Nobel 
prize committee yet. <laughs> and, and, even it, and we were also suspicious of it because that seemed way too good. So we did a, another formal experiment. Again, 50 sessions, we did other things I don't have time to talk about on this. But one of the things I'm showing here now is this is the control results, uh, and it's lagged in time. And the reason why we look at the results lagged in time is because if you ask somebody to now concentrate, and then a little while later, now relax, you can't switch your mind instantaneously. So we expect that there should be a delay in the, in the results of the experiment because it takes mind, the mind to switch gears. So this provides actually a nice secondary way of, of looking for the results that we hope to find because if there is no delay, then you have to be suspicious about the results. So here's, the, so here's time zero, which is when the instruction is given to switch your attention. There's the experimental results with the lag from zero to 15 seconds, and in fact, we got a slightly better result with two second delay. So I'm not gonna talk about this analysis again for the re remainder of the experiments, but we did this sort of lag analysis in all of the studies that we've done. So after doing the second formal experiment, again, getting over a five sigma result, uh, we got suspicious. So maybe this was caused simply by proximity of the human body. Even though it was two meters away from the, the double set system, we figured that maybe when somebody's asked to concentrate, they lean forward slightly. And for those of you who've worked with interferometers, you know that they're exquisitely sensitive to everything. So we, we thought maybe the temperature change from a body one inch closer versus one inch away would be sufficient to make this result. So we decided to put the entire thing on the internet so we'd be sure that we could rigorously separate people by distance. So there's the double slip. This is sitting on a rack that has a bunch of servers on it. Uh, and we, we ran this uh, for three solid years, calendar years 2012, 13, and 14, ended up with over 5,000 sessions done by human observers and 7,000 done by robot observers. And I'll explain what that means in a minute. So when somebody would sign on to our website, this was a public site, by the way, we got people from around the world to do this, in a non-observing condition, what you would see is this blue rectangle on the browser screen and simply saying, please relax and you'd hear no sound. And then it would switch, you'd hear a voice saying, now please concentrate. And then you would start seeing this line move along the screen, the instructions were to make the line go up, and you would hear a kind of a whistling, a whistling sound that was a tone, and you're, the, the tone would go up and down as the line went up and down. And we did that so again, you could do this experiment with your eyes closed. Uh, there were also lots of checks and balances built in here. We knew, for example, if somebody left the experiment while it was going and we would then mark, we'd restore all the data, but we'd mark it as this was an experiment that, uh, that was not completed by a person. For the, what we call the robot experiment, it was a Linux system which was designed to simulate a human. Now, the beauty of this is that the, everything was exactly the same as far as a double slit system was concerned because it didn't know, we think, it didn't know whether a human was looking at it or a Linux system because they both came through the internet in the same way. So we have very nice control for human observation versus we don't know whether a Linux system is conscious or not, but if it is, it probably doesn't have the same level of consciousness as a human. So here's the interference pattern. Uh, this is a, the central portion of the interference pattern that the camera would see. What we did on this was a simpler measure than we did before, and this is called fringe visibility which looks at, the, at a peak and a trough, and it measures the relative difference between the two. And this is nice, because if, if you work with lasers, you know that they, they're not in, amazingly stable. Some of them are more stable than others. We were using a helium-neon gas laser, which is known to do things like mode hopping. Power levels will slightly change. And you have to jump through some statistical hoops in order to reduce the effect of that mode hopping. But for fringe visibility, you don't need to worry about that so much because this is now a relative measure and takes into account that there may be fluctuations in power. So it's a more sensitive measure as well. So the prediction is fringe visibility while you're observing would go down. So it's somewhat similar to expect, expectation that double slit power would go down. In this case, it's fringe visibility. So this is the result of the sessions in 2012. There are 2,300 and three sessions done by the Linux system. 
Uh, these are the middle 20 fringes of the interference pattern, and it shows in terms of z-scores where it was. There's one or two of them that were around three sigma, uh, but overall it was pretty close to chance. And this is what we got with human observers. So some, again, approached five sigma differences. Uh, that was 2,089 sessions by 689 people around the world. So what's nice here is they're able to look at yet another issue, which is does distance matter? So this is the distribution of the effect sizes from where we were in California to the farthest that you can get from our laboratory, which is South Africa, which is 18,000 kilometers away. And so we did the uh, linear regression. It turns out to be flat to six decimal places, but not null. It actually, that line looks like it points at zero, but it's below zero. That's why we end up with a significant effect. So the observer effect is independent of distance. We then, uh, again, in every case when we do an experiment and get a result like that, we don't believe it ourselves and have to replicate it just to convince ourselves that it's real. So we did it again the calendar year 2013 and 2014. Uh, so here are 5,700 sessions of the controls. So this is now a cumulative deviation plot. So cumulatively, you should expect that the deviations that you see in, these, in this experiment should sort of hover around zero. There shouldn't be any systematic deviation, and there, there isn't. There's a slight positive movement in the 2013 data, but not in 2014. This is the controls. Then we look at the experimental results. So in 2013, we got a, a cumulative uh, march towards fringe dropping, fringe visibility dropping, which is what we had seen before and what we had predicted. But 2014, it just kept getting more and more positive. And this was a big puzzle. Uh, we, as far as we could tell, the, the system was the same. It, it's turned on and has left on for the entire year. It's never turned off. The program is the same. Everything was the same. And when you do the statistics on it, sure enough, it completely reverses. So this was a big puzzle. It took about a month for me to figure out what was happening here. And the, the reason why it reversed is this, that when you think about a conventional coordinate system, because remember that the way that we present the feedback here is a, a, a squiggly line that moves on a graph. And going up on the graph was linked to feedback that fringe visibility was dropping. So that's the way that we had set it up in 2013. In 2014, we decided to slightly change it a little bit with the hopes of making the feedback a little better. But we forgot something. A conventional a Cartesian coordinate system looks like this, but in Adobe Flash, it's upside down. And the, we wrote the, the browser, uh, the client program in Flash. And we forgot that you have to reverse the sign. Well, why does, why does Adobe do that? It's like it's backwards. Well, it's because it goes back to the, the, the old days when we had uh, CRTs with a raster scan, and it would start from the top and go down. And so they, they left that code in to the Adobe system, and so you simply have to remember that you need to reverse signs, which we forgot in 2014. So it meant that in 2014, the feedback was reversed, and the results were reversed. So this suggests that the observational effect we're looking at is, is an active effect. It's not simply that, that consciousness collapses the wave function, but it more is that it's something like a quantum Zeno effect, and it steers the direction that you're going. So when you take the overall results from 2013 and 14 and you reverse the sign of the results in 2014, you get a very healthy result for people and very close to chance for the, the robot sessions. Uh, by the way, all of this data, it's about 80 gigabytes of data. It's, it's millions of camera frames with the interference patterns. We'll all be, it's being put online as we speak and will be available uh, eventually when all of that data is uploaded so anybody can look at it. So now a skeptic could say, but is this really a quantum effect given that you're, you're dealing with a gazillion photons per second with a continuous beam laser? Uh, to which I replied, that's a good point. Let's do the same experiment, one photon at a time. So we used a commercial system. Uh, it's, that, uh, it's a little over a meter long. Uh, and you can shoot a single photon at a time and then see whether or not you get interference with, uh, through, with a double set system. On the right end of that, that long uh, chamber is a photomultiplier, and that's what detects the single photons. 
So the way to do this, since you're measuring one photon at a time, is you, you set up uh, what the photomultiplier looks at, and then you move it a little bit, and you move it a little bit, you move a little slide, so you're only getting a little piece of the interference pattern. And as you move that back and forth, you can actually trace out an interference pattern, and that's what you see here. And you see by the error bars on it that it's very tightly controlled. So in this case, we decided to have observation linked to one of the troughs. Now, the trough exists in this case because of destructive interference. So we figured that if observation is getting rid of the interference, then photons should increase in this case at that point. So we set up uh, the system to look at that point with the prediction that when people observe the system, the line would go up. Uh, we did six experiments, and I'm just going to mention one briefly. We call this the Illuminated Buddha Experiment because uh, we have a little Buddha statue and put an LED in it that would get brighter the better you did. And the experiment was done in complete darkness. Uh, there was also a tone associated with this, so you could do it with your eyes closed, but this turned out to be a very pleasant kind of thing to do because in complete darkness, the LED would light up this slightly yellow-colored Buddha, and it would, it would glow yellow, and it was a very pleasant experience. Uh, we found, actually, in all of these experiments that if you think of this simply as, uh, as Physics 101, it may or may not work. Uh, we spent a lot of time making sure that the individuals that we chose were comfortable and understood the design and gave them a, a, a lot of uh, leeway in terms of how they wanted to mentally interact with the system. So the psychological side of this is just as important as the physical side. So this is the result with the, the illuminated Buddha experiment. We predicted that that would go up, and it went up by two and a half sigma. So that was good. Uh, we published this last year, and this got a, a, a prize for the best paper in that journal. So we've done 17 experiments of this type, uh, most of them, 16 of them, using a double slit system over eight years. And you can put this into a meta-analytic software, and the bottom line is this. That depending on whether you use a fixed effect size or a random effect size, somewhere between around four to eight uh, sigma effects. So it looks pretty robust. And all of this is still predicated on the idea that we're expecting a, a drop in double slit power. So in the, in the case of uh, 2014 on the online system, actually the results went in the other direction. So I'm not taking into account variance effects. This is simply a mean shift. And in mean shift terms, it's still four to eight sigma. You could then also ask questions like, is this due to p-hacking? Uh, well, no, it's not due to p-hacking. Are the results due to selective reporting? No, they're not due to selective reporting. There's lots of, of, way, of nice software now that you can put, uh, use data that goes into a meta-analysis and start asking these questions about questionable research practices. And of course, we knew what we were doing. We knew not to do selective reporting and not to p-hack and not to do a whole bunch of things. But it was nice to see that the software confirmed that that was the case. So, we so far uh, have two independent reanalyses of our online data from 2013 and 14. Nicholas Tremby is a, a, a PhD uh, postdoc uh, in physics who's in France, and he came to visit us for a month, and we gave him the 80 gigabytes of data and said, see, see what you can get. So he was able to confirm that the results that we reported in that paper, which just came out this year, was correct. And a second analysis was done by Wolfgang Baer, who's a physicist in, in the United States, uh, and he independently verified that the results were correct as well, and he, he did publish that result. In terms of replications of the experiment, there is a physicist at the University of Sao Paulo, who I don't have permission yet to say who he is, uh, but he's doing a replication. I, I actually sent him our little double slit itself. It's like a $200 piece of metal. So I sent him that. And then uh, two days ago, I asked him, well, how's it going? I didn't hear about any results yet. So this is exactly what he wrote in an email. In the last days, it has been an intense mixture of feelings. I'm oscillating between, oh my god, and wait, something must be wrong. <laughs> and this, by the way, is pretty similar to the results, to the same feelings that we had when we were doing these experiments, because you don't often get results that are five sigma in any experiment. But it was showing up here. So, the reason we kept doing replications is exactly the same, 
sentiment that, that this physicist is saying. So he's going to visit us starting next week, and it'll remain for the month of May, and we'll go over in, in fine detail the, uh, of his analysis and his methods to see whether he should be leaning towards, oh my god, or something must be wrong. What, what are other explanations for the results that we've been seeing in this? Well, first of all, maybe there's something idiosyncratic about the apparatus that we use. Well, we've used four double slit systems. We get the, pretty much the same result in all of them. Uh, vibration is always a problem when you're dealing with interferometers because it's extremely sensitive to vibration. Most of our experiments were conducted inside our electromagnetically shielded chamber, which is uh, solid steel, double walled, and 2,800 pounds. So normally you'd have an optical table, a very heavy one that would damp out vibrations. In this case, it was as though we were running inside an optical table, because 2,800 pound table is very good at damping out vibrations. Uh, another problem that may result is that since we're using 30-second segments, that if power happened to fluctuate in a 30-second period, you can end up with an artifact. And this is why we use random timing on the, on the, uh, the non-observation periods between 30 to 35 seconds to decouple so that in case there was an, an external cycle, eventually it would, it would wash out because we were no longer exactly at 30 seconds. Uh, signal drift is always a problem as well. It was very small changes in temperature will cause interferometers to change, so when necessary, we would detrend the data. Uh, we measured temperature at the, the laser itself, the double slit near the human uh, with multiple thermocouples, and we didn't find any effect due to temperature. Uh, the, we were very careful not to use parametric statistics on this. All of the stats were based on our parametric bootstrap statistics which take into account funny business that may be going on in terms of the distribution of data. I mentioned that there are two independent analyses so far. We know it's not p-hacking, we know it's not selective reporting, and independent replication is underway. So common questions on this that arise. How do we know that the participants are actually performing the task? Well, as in any psychology experiment, you kind of have to assume that they're following instructions, but you don't really know that's why you run lots of sessions with lots of people. In this case, though, because uh, we were also have the capability of doing uh, neuroscience, we took advantage of, of the fact that uh, alpha desynchronization is associated with focused attention. So we predicted, while people were doing the experiment, we took their EEG, and we predicted a correlation between the amount of alpha desync and changes in double slit power. And we, in fact, got a significant correlation of the type that we predicted. How come no one has noticed this before? Well, two reasons. One is that no one's looked for it, and the second is that the magnitude is very small. The magnitude of this effect is a very small fraction of 1%. So if you were, if you were not thinking that something like this could happen, it would simply look like noise. It's not noise in our case, because this is exactly what we're looking for. So what's the response to this so far? The response is this. And the reason is, is clear. It's because extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, and in this case requires dozens of independent replications for people to start believing this. And there aren't any replications yet, except maybe the one in Sao Paulo. Uh, so if there aren't any replications, then why should anybody believe me? Well, as Johnny Depp tells us, it's actually not true that there are no replications. If you look at 1977, Abner Shimoni and his team at Boston University did an experiment on the same general idea to see if consciousness would collapse the wave function. And they did a, a somewhat some different design. They didn't use an optical system like I did. But they did four, 554 trials with a 50% chance hit rate, and they got exactly 50%. So they kind of lost interest in it. But they mentioned in their paper that somebody else did the same experiment, and they got a 60% hit rate which you think might have encouraged them to actually do it again, but they didn't, so it just sat there. In 1998, uh, Stan Jeffers at York University in Canada did an experiment with a double slit system and got nothing, so a non-significant result, but Mike Ibbison used the same apparatus at Princeton, and he did get a significant result. So what we have now are two out of four tests that were successful, and that's it. Well, it turns out, no, we, we want more. We always want more. So many of you may be aware that for many years, people have been using electronic random number generators where the numbers 
the, the basis of the randomness are quantum phenomena, either radioactive decay times or uh, electron tunneling or other phenomena. Like the one in the upper right there is using uh, photons that hit a mirror, uh, a half-silvered mirror, and either go straight through or bounce off to the side, which is a random, quantum random effect. So people have been using these things for almost over 50 years now. To give an example, 1985, Bob John and Brenda Dunn at Princeton University did an experiment with a random number generator where they asked people to aim high, meaning make, make the generator produce more ones, or aim O, more zeros, or do nothing as a baseline. And they report highly significant results. And what was the reaction to that? Not good enough. And it's the same suspicion you always get, that it's one laboratory producing a result that is kind of outside the mainstream, so people are suspicious. So a couple of years later, uh, Roger Nelson and I, uh, when we were both at Princeton, decided to see, is it really true there's just one lab showing these results? Well, it turns out, over a period of about 30 years, that there wasn't just one lab. There were 68 different investigators reporting this in 152 publications. Uh, not just one experiment, but almost 600 and 200 controls. And you look at the overall results on the controls, you get something that's very close to chance in terms of the mean shift. And in terms of the experimental data, almost a seven sigma result. So there's replications. The same kind of analysis was done again in 2006, bringing it up to date, but only looking at a subset, a subset of about half of the studies that have been done using random number generators. And again, the uh, sigma was somewhere between 3.6 to 4 sigma results. Now, the authors of this study suggested that the, re the reason for those results was selective reporting. And they, they gave reasons why they believe that, and I don't believe it, because I'm pretty well aware of everyone who had reported this, and there simply aren't enough people around to reduce the effect by selective reporting. So what's the overall reaction to something like this? We're saying, well, would you look through the telescope? No. We don't want to. And the, the reason is this. So a lot of people have felt, and I've heard explicitly people saying, if this is true, we need to throw away the textbooks. So we can't throw away the textbooks because we know too much already. That is probably correct within each, band, each discipline in science. So what do we do with this? I'm going to pre present the world's fastest uh, analysis of what's happening here. So reductive materialism is predicated on a model that looks something like this. Physics is at the bottom, chemistry, biology, psychology, consciousness is somewhere near the top, uh, but consciousness doesn't mean anything. And from this perspective, uh, the idea that mind and matter directly interact with each other in some way is forbidden. Or at least it's very difficult to think of a way that it could work. Now, Stuart Hameroff has come up with an interesting model, and there are more and more models coming along that suggest that there may be a way to stick within the existing scientific paradigm and solve this problem. But the other approach, of course, is to take exactly the same disciplinary structure, but just take consciousness and stick it down there. So it's a new metaphysical base on which we sit. From this perspective, just like in physics where you have electrons that go everywhere up in the pyramid, here we'd have consciousness that starts at the bottom and goes everywhere up. So this is idealism, panpsychism, neutral monism, use whatever your favorite term is. From this perspective, the, the real puzzle is how do we get from consciousness or awareness into physics? Because if you solve that problem, and there are people working on that too, well then all the rest of it is perfectly fine. And we don't need to throw any textbooks away, except we're gonna throw them away every two or three years anyway because that's what happens. They're not thrown away completely, they're just revised. So in this case, mind-matter interaction actually is quite easy to explain. So here's my conclusion then. First of all, the role of consciousness in the physical world can be tested. It has been tested many times in many different ways. The results so far suggest that consciousness plays some sort of an active participation in reality. So we have lots of collaborators that have worked with us over the years and a number of different funders. Uh, I'm gonna leave this up for a bit. If you want references to all of the studies that, that have published, including many more studies, you go to tinyearl.com and that, that spot and you can find it. It may be that this is uh, the one that Newton missed. And I thank you for your kind attention.
switch it over? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's take one or two uh, while uh, Stu Kaufman get, gets ready. Okay, I'll leave that up. Uh, excellent, excellent work, Dean. Um, would you be interested in, uh, if there was some grant money available, in doing a uh, meta study that covers all the work that's been done? Because it seems that this is missing because the only meta study was uh, in part, it was not complete. You're asking a scientist if he'd be interested in funding? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Just say yes. Talk. Okay, good. Yes. So let's talk. All right. Over there. Hi, uh, excellent talk. Uh, I have just two questions. One is the role of the feedback. You gave always feedback as a tone. Uh, if you don't give it, uh, what happens? And the second one is that uh, you found the correlation between alpha uh, deco uh, synchronization and the effect size, which seems really reasonable. But you also found the effect with the internet, right? And I, I really can't imagine what kind of you know, mechanism can cause the effect over the internet. What's the your explanation? Did you understand what he said? The first one is uh, the role of the feedback. The role of the what? Feedback. Feedback, right. Feedback. So we, we use feedbacks in, in feedback in almost every study, mainly as a way to focus people's minds on the task at hand, but also because of transactional uh, interpretations of quantum mechanics. So it was simply an easier way of imagining how a human could interact with a system at a distance through the interaction itself. So the feedback then became the way that the two were connected. But is it possible the feedback itself is causing this effect? Oh, would the feedback cause the effect? So when we do a control study, we have it exactly the same. So the feedback is running during the control as well. So if it was an artifact that was caused by the feedback, then it would have shown up in the control studies, and they don't. Mm. And the second question was the, how, how it's possible that, you know, even if alpha desynchronization is the cause of this effect, when you are doing it in you know, a two meter away, what, how, how it's possible to produce the f same kind of effect through the internet? Through the, through the internet? Yeah. Uh, well, we don't know. Uh, but of course, it suggests that whatever's going on in terms of consciousness is not, it's, it's non-local. You don't have to be in proximity to the system. Uh, two more questions and we'll move on. Dean, um, lovely talk, of course. But you, you mentioned the quantum Zeno effect somehow guiding somewhere in the middle of your talk. Could you just expand on that? I thought you were going to expand on that. Well, I, <laughs> I thought you were going to talk about the quantum zero effect. I will talk about the quantum okay, zero yeah, effect, but, but, but how okay. does it guide in, in your... Well, how does it guide, I don't know. In, in this particular case, though, it is a, a well-known quantum phenomena that the means by which you're observing a system can push it in different directions. So in this case, we had feedback that basically reversed what we originally had seen, okay, which caused the reversal. Thank you. Yeah, so I am... Um, I'm interested in these interpretations of quantum mechanics where consciousness collapses the wave function, but I guess it's just not obvious to me how this kind of anomalous effect provides any evidence for those interpretations over and above evidence, that, for example, you know, really boring evidence we already have, like if you look at what's going on in the double slit, you get collapsed results and remove interference patterns and so on. You might think that's prima facie evidence, but it turns out all the other interpretations of quantum mechanics can accommodate that evidence pretty well. It seems to me that what you have here is, if the evidence holds up, evidence for some kind of mechanism of interaction between brains, human observers, and what's going on in the, uh, in the double slit. But that's, inter that's independent of the, of the question of interpretation. I would think that all the interpretations of quantum mechanics will agree that if there is some such mechanism of interaction between the human observer and what's going on in the double slit, then you'd get various, you know, collapse style results. So it seems to me that it's not clear to me this actually gives direct evidence for this kind of interpretation, much as I'd like it to. Well, remember that the, the motivation for this was explicitly looking at what von Neumann said about an extra physical factor. So we used the extra physical factor in as best a way that we could think of doing it, and in fact was confirming, at least to a small degree, uh, what von Neumann was basically saying, that it was beginning to cut the chain. Now, why didn't it com completely collapse? My guess is because, uh, well, we did see better result with meditators versus non-meditators, so there's something about focused attention that is a critical element. And it's, it's a very difficult task. Even the long-term meditators found it difficult because of the abstraction of the task. But we're looking at other ways of making it easier for people to interact with these kinds of systems, in which case maybe we'll get stronger results. 
I'll bet uh, Von Neumann meant extra material because entanglement is physical. One, please be quick. So. Yeah, uh, I'm just curious about the effect of conscious and unconscious processes on, on this type of experiment. So if you were able to design a paradigm where you could uh, suppress the interaction from consciousness, because the unconscious processes are in place while awareness is rising or is there, let's say. What would be your expectation? So if we manage to suppress it from conscious, unconscious processes equally interact or? If we were able to suppress unconscious? No, if we were able to suppress uh, the interaction from consciousness using, there are various techniques to do that. Well, we could use things like distraction. We use the simplest possible method that we could think of initially, which is simply to withdraw your attention from the system. And the way we do that in terms of the feedback is you don't get any feedback. So that portion of it is cut. But we, we had thought of other things too, like we'd have somebody read something on a screen or other forms. The problem with doing strong distraction of attention is that it takes a lot longer to switch back into the task. And we didn't want to do that. All right. Let's give Dina a round of applause. That was great. <laughs>